more than one proper interpretation, more than one way of kind of thinking about phrasing or rhythm or strong points. Um, also, it's cool to play something by a female composer, and it's also cool to play something by a composer who is still alive and out there somewhere. How many of you were familiar with this piece before the last about six minutes of your lives? That's awesome. We have an obligation as musicians to be proponents of all things across the entire spectrum of our industry and of our art. So first of all, well, second of all, beautiful performance, and thank you for bringing the rest of our energy joy. What is the name of the movement, and how does it fit into the larger context of the piece? The name of the first movement is Mute and Pagan Beginnings. And so this is kind of, I think this is definitely the most chaotic movement of the three, um, which I think ties as really well into maybe our like stereotypes about kind of like the pagan era, like insert like Stravinsky, Red Spring, um, but also, you know, kind of taking it in then from a larger, uh, more nuanced historical context of like, you know, so in the fourth century, uh, paganism was one of the dominant religions of that era. Christianity was still, um, forming its identity and its teachings, and St. Augustine was a huge kind of voice in that, and kind of creating a bit more of the structure. And so I, I feel like he's, he's kind of maybe kind of interrupting that throughout this this very very interesting era of history that we even now don't know what's on about just because there's so few writings and historical artifacts that have survived from that period. And they're continuing to demonstrate exactly why you picked this piece, which for me is all based on art. You're all selecting something that's incredibly deeply art-based. Mm -hmm. There is, I would say, a, a biographical mm -hmm. context to this, certainly. Specifically, what is the really close connection that Erica Rahm might be depicting in terms of paganism? Mm -hmm. Who was close to St. Augustine? Who was born? His dad. Mom was a devout Catholic. And um, regardless of what I am no theological expert by any sort of imagination, imagination but um, to do even a little bit of a deeper dive beyond what you've already done, which is absolutely fantastic, will help you either engage in role play or to pick a really specific story. So this could be a personal depiction. This could be, um, let me ask you, what's St. Augustine's, in terms of infancy, what's his belief about original sin, and how is that possibly depicted in this movement? Our culture. He believes that everyone is born in sin. That infancy is a, a volatile, violent state until you achieve some kind of spiritual excellence. So this, it, there's moments in this that are, that are truly violent. And then as the piece evolves, you're learning more about him in adolescence, you're learning about him more later in life. He wrote 13 books. These are the Confessions of St. Augustine. So we have a long way to go in terms of story time. So I think we can dig really in total depth of every single detail on this page. Mm -hmm. You and I have previously discussed the impact of recurring motives in a freeform piece like this. What is the opening motive? Can you play it for us? In its original form. What is the character right off the bat? Chaotic. How can you make it in your very refined mastery command of the horn playing? How can you make the illusion of chaos clearer? I think what I'm going to try to do is I'm going to try to compress my triplets just a little bit more. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and they're written also for those not not horn players in the audience. Um, it's written in the middle register, so they're going to speak really well, but they sit in such a way that there's going to be a lot of motion. I'm going to use all four of my keys, which for the woodwinds in the audience, four keys. Wow. Um, <laughs> And not impressed. Not impressed. Um, so I want a little bit more uh, of flick to it, and then I think I want to land a little bit more solidly on the last two notes to just kind of serve as a sign of 
is. It's not like we're all sitting here expecting Strauss's first horn concerto to bring out every single detail. Mm -hmm. Later, in the final tempo one, it's marked. The slurred and articulation indications are in different spots. Um, the tempo remains the same. The triple motion, the rhythmic integrity, that can remain the same. Can you make it oovier, goovier? And this might have to do with your four keys. And how smoothly you can play. For example, how smooth can you get some three? Tongue two, three on each other. Third part of the sequence. 
We are still living within the youth and pain beginnings of his life. So it's such, it's the simplest changes are required for this Advent story to It's lower by how much? Um, by a fourth. Hang on. There's tension created in the interval. Ton of tension created in the interval. What about um, dynamic markings? Um, well, there's an overall softer. Um, it grows to a beta spot, though. Um, so we're kind of starting from the piano. And that's important to which I think I said it when we were on the discussion last time. We came back down to the piano all the way up to the fucking piano. I appreciate your risk, frankly. Mm -hmm. Compared to some of the section playing we'll be doing in the sprint, the dynamic spectrum required of you as a solo artist is generally more, I would say, refined. You've got to pick your moments for of what she whispers soft, and then you have to pick a few moments where you really put out some sound. Mm -hmm. Generally, you're going to be in that sounds good presence. I wouldn't even call it a dynamic. But here, I think the audience is a bit here slightly. <laughs> Yeah. 
characters that I generally like enjoy playing musically, and they also like fit into the style of playing that I'm decent at um, and feel more comfortable with. So that's, that's what I'm doing. Are you convinced?
it was on the page. So. <laughs> I honestly wouldn't mind trying it again um, and having those exaggerations while also maintaining the level of accuracy. <laughs> <laughs> I still appreciate risk of accuracy when we commit our oral imagination and our intent and our whim. The accuracy will come. The art will inspire that the vast majority of the time. And if you say, Maura, no, you're wrong. I'm just missing all of my minor sevens. <laughs> then we have a different conversation <laughs> about that. Can your opening be sweeter? What does a Mahler Espresivo indication mean to you compared to, say, Brahms? They're both romantic. What else does it mean? Chicago 
did say? It was top notch. Bad bowl. <laughs> what vowel would you like Zach to use? Is it a ooh? Is it an ah? Is it an ooh? Like an umlaut? What do you want him to use? This is German, after all. Did you have anyone go specifically in your head the first time you played it? Or was it horn? Ta? Tai. <laughs> oh, it was Tai. It was diphthong. Thank you. Man, after my own heart, give me a good old diphthong. Can you start up and let it start with breath?
for when I get to party again, not on this stage. Because I think every moment we spent on this was time well spent. You just have to decide which moments based on the score, it's all chamber, it's very intimate. Where are you saving it for? Where are you saving that key moment? And how much of this is just very conversational but very personal? It's really it's a beautiful line. It's very good. Keep that tongue, but like don't talk to it. It's like weed. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you. 
Just that same
and this is the color. And specifically, it's entirely different color, it's stock corn. <laughs> so your stock corn has to be impeccable. I could spend a whole hour exploring different flavorings with you. I will not. I'm more interested in how you treat silence and how you treat praising. So can you play for me? Um, and your after the stock corn play. So I'm going to join you on the
counted A on the SM. Think about all those lovely portamento moments in the string. The students do it all the time. It's true, don't deny it. Oh. <laughs> Can you give me a bit of a valve gliss into rehearsal two? <laughs>
page, and Mahler is like the exact opposite, where there's all the information, <laughs> uh, almost too much information. The, the Bach, there's no dynamic the markings, almost no articulation markings, and the ones that are on the page are probably not written by Bach, they're probably by whoever edited this. So you have to, I think, be very intentional with how you approach it. Very good. Anything you like to add? Pretty much covered it. It needs to be really, really light. Mm -hmm. Second horn needs to match first horn really well, stylistically, which is mostly what I was listening for. Mm -hmm. Can you do me a favor? Take out all the slides you don't need.
said, we'll say she has to come into her democracy too. That was a beautiful way to end this class. Thanks to all five of you for playing. And thank you all for coming and supporting these five fabulous young pros. Thank you, thank you.